Elden Ring is here. And of course, you know, like any good From Software game, there are a bunch of things that the game doesn't spell out for you. Some things you really got to figure out for yourself. We got a bunch of tips for you, but Keep in mind, a lot of the fun of this game is just discovering this stuff for yourself. That being said, we got some cool tips and tricks, so let's get started with number 10. Spirit tuning is a major gameplay element that's shockingly easy to miss out on. Outside Stormvale Castle, you can find a woman in a shack named Rotorica. She seems like just another random FromSoft NPC, but she's actually one of the most important NPCs in the game, and completing her quest line unlocks an almost invaluable service. So what you want to do is talk to her, then go into Stormvale castle and find an item off this pile of dead bodies next to the disgusting grafting room in the castle. Now return to her after finding this thing and keep talking to her until she says that she'll go to the round table hold. Now go talk to her there and it seems like there's nothing else to it but if you talk to the blacksmith then he'll have new dialogue options uh, saying that she'd make a good spirit tuner. Now go back and talk to her then back to the blacksmith and just keep going with this until she actually becomes a spirit tuner and sets up shots next to the blacksmith. Now, like I said, it all sounds simple, but it's extremely easy to skip, especially if you don't spend much time in the round table hold. Her spirit tuning is so useful that it allows you to upgrade any spirit ashes you have. And these upgrades are pretty significant. You can turn chumps that you summon that like die to basic enemies into total tanks that can make certain bosses way easier. Now, spirit summoning is an excellent new feature that is a lot of fun to use, but to really get the most of it, make sure to finish this girl's quest line. Seriously, Upgraded spirits are so much better, and it's crazy that you can miss it. Next over at number nine, like pretty much all these Souls type games, there are a few items you really, really wanna find as early as possible. Unlike those games, it's possible to go dozens of hours in this game without finding these things because they're only held by very specific vendors that you can really easily pass up if you don't notice them. So we're just gonna tell you a couple of them. Now, just to start, be sure to buy the torch from the vendor at the Church of Ella. You know, the one at the very start of the game. You might skip it thinking you'll just find one later, but don't count on that. Torches are great for seeing in the dark, but one item you really, really need is the lantern. Now, like in other games in this type of thing, it's a light you wear on your hip, allowing you to use both hands still in dark areas. There are a lot of dark areas in this game too, a lot of caves, so you need this thing. The earliest one you can get is from the merchant at the isolated merchant shack checkpoint in the southwest of the Weeping Peninsula past the mausoleum. And two other essential items are either a crossbow or a bow, depending on your build. You know, having one of these can really just save your life, but they're both shockingly rare to find out in the wild. A very good crossbow called the Black Key crossbow can be found just by using the stone sword key door or at the round table hold. It's behind the first of two of these doors in the area. There's a very good bow that can also be found relatively early too. Uh, in the underground region connected to the river well in the Mistwood area, look for a corpse under the stairwell to the hollow horn grounds. That's where you can get the horn bow. It's a great and easy to use one. Now, next over at number eight, there's a secret way to make the shockingly difficult first boss a lot easier. Now, the first real boss of the game is this dude named Margit, Margit, and he sucks right from the start. Like a lot of these types of games, like he's that first big roadblock and you know it can genuinely surprise some new coming players and even some veterans. If you're struggling, don't worry, you're not the only one. Apparently the developers realized how brutal he is and they put a special item in the game to make it a little bit easier. To reveal how to get this thing is a bit of a spoiler, so if you don't want to be surprised, then know that there's an item you can buy from a vendor at the Murkwater Cave in the deep canal of the center of Limgrave. But if you want a more detailed explanation, then go into the cave and enter a suspiciously empty boss room. Open the chest inside and you'll get ambushed by a familiar face. Now beat on him enough and he'll give up, but don't kill him. Leave and come back and he'll open up a shop that you can access. Now the item you want to buy is this one. It's Margit's Shackle, which when used during the fight will chain the boss to the ground for several seconds so you can wail on him as much as you want. It only works a few times so it's not just like an easy button, but if you save it for the second half of the fight when he gets crazy aggressive, it'll help you out. Next over at number seven, there's something you should always consider doing before spending Remembrance. Now, if and when you finally manage to kill one of the shard bearers, the main bosses of the game, you get two things as a reward. A great rune that you have to take to a certain divine tower to gain its power, and a Remembrance, which is pretty much just a Lord Soul from Dark Souls. Now, so just like in Dark Souls, you can either immediately use the Remembrance to gain a ton of runes, or you can spend it to get one of two special items from the Finger Reader in 
the round table hold. Usually, you can get one of the boss's weapons or a spell that lets you perform one of their attacks. There's nothing too surprising about any of this. You know, anyone who's played one of these games knows how this works, but before you decide to use up a remembrance for runes or buy a weapon with one, there's really something you should consider doing first. There is actually a way to duplicate these remembrances, which is obviously incredibly useful. You can get both boss weapons. Uh, you can just use them twice for the runes, do whatever you want. The actual way to do it is surprisingly easy as well. All you have to do is find these giant things called walking mausoleums. You might not even realize you can do anything with these guys, but it's actually possible to defeat them by destroying the glowing stones on their legs. Now do enough damage to them and they'll fall to the ground, giving you access to their interior. Inside, you can find a tomb that allows remembrance duplication. You can only duplicate one per tomb, so you'll have to be selective about which ones you want to copy, but don't be too precious about them because there's more of these things than you might realize. The earliest one you can access is in the Weeping Peninsula to the south, but for a real treasure trove of those things, look in the northeast part of Liurnia, in the rockiness around north of the ruined labyrinth checkpoint. There's two more there and at least one more down in the actual lake area as well. So before using a remembrance, find these walking mausoleum guys and duplicate them. Next over at number six, the right ashes of war can turn the tide of battle in your favor. Now, we're not gonna do a lot of gameplay tips here because there's, you know, more than enough to talk about in this game without getting into that stuff, but there's one thing that we underestimated at the start of the game. It's the ashes of war. At first, we figured that they were slightly more modular versions of the weapon arts from Dark Souls 3. You know, kind of a cool novelty, but in practice, not always useful. But here's the thing. A lot of these things are incredibly good here. Like, with the right application of ashes, you can turn certain fights that seem almost impossible into a cakewalk. I'm mainly going for a combat build for our first go around here, so uh, one of the things that we really started gravitating towards is the ground slam, where you jump up into the air and do a big butt stomp on your enemies. Uh, it looks ridiculous, but it's undeniably effective. It's an easy way to jump into the fight and do a ton of damage. It can't be interrupted, and because you jump in the air, most enemies attacks will just miss anyway. And that's just one example. Try out a bunch of these things when you get them and see what works for you. Because these things are generally great. It makes refilling your FP meter actually something you'll want to do. Don't make all of your flasks healing ones, you know, just keep at least one FP restoring flask so you can restore it when you need it, specifically if you're mostly a strength or dex build. Next over at number five, there are some very good talismans hidden in the dark corners of this game, but some of the best can be obtained almost right from the beginning. If you aren't afraid to die a few times, then there's some amazing stuff to get that can help you out for the rest of the game. The first is something that you can get literally at the start, in the stranded graveyard, the place where you start the game. If you use a stone sword key and remove the fog gate beside the very first checkpoint of the game, then you can enter this brutal trap filled dungeon. Now inside is an item you really want called the Erd Tree's Favor, which raises your max HP, stamina, and equip load. Now to get it, you need to run down this ramp and avoid the giant chariot of death, fall down this ledge, and then, and this is the most important thing, instead of running down the narrow bridge on the second ramp, you'll want to fall down to the secret ledge. From here, go down this hallway to a large chapel-like room, and the talisman you want is on the altar right there. Now just dash forward and grab it before the grafted enemies on the ceiling fall down and kill you, and you'll be good. Uh, this is all easier said than done, of course, and will probably take a few tries, but it's totally doable. Now the second item we wanted to highlight is the Blessed Dew Talisman, which causes your HP to gradually restore when you have it equipped. Now outside of the obvious, what makes this so good is that it's strong enough to completely cancel poison damage. If you get poisoned and have this equipped, you won't lose any health, which is pretty awesome. To get this thing, go to this lonely guard tower in the Weeping Peninsula called the Tower of Return. You can find it southeast from the Lonely Merchant Shack checkpoint. Now, there's a teleport on this thing that'll take you directly into the heart of the capital, an area you normally wouldn't see until much, much later in the game. There's a very tough giant sentinel up here that you'll probably want to avoid. Uh, just beeline for this little alcove containing the talisman, and then look for the teleport out of there. Now, both of these things may take you a few tries to get right, especially the Erd Tree's favorite, but they're totally worth it.
And now at number four, like in most of these games, you can perform gestures, which are mostly for communicating in multiplayer or to just mess around, but they have some additional functions in this game. Certain puzzles and quests can only be solved by the proper use of emotes, like this one tower that tells you something about how good erudition is. Now, there doesn't seem to be any way to continue, but what you actually have to do is use the erudition gesture in front of the altar here, and a ghostly ladder will suddenly materialize. There's an even crazier one that has to do with the howling you can hear in the Mistwood. If you talk to the vendor in the Church of Ella, he tells you to do something at the source of the howling. Then if you go to the place where howling can be heard, and then use the finger snap gesture, a half-wolf warrior will appear, and he has an entire quest line you could potentially follow. So if you ever hit a dead end, look for the clues, and maybe an emote or a move like that is the solution. Now next over at number three, illusory walls are back. Yep, the thing that we all love to hate returns an Elden Ring, and if you're curious how they work, here's a quick explanation. One of the most infuriating things about these games is how inconsistent the fake walls can be. In some games, they're revealed by attacking them. In some, you have to press the action button on the walls instead, and in some, uh, they just aren't in the game at all. Now, we assume this game would have some, uh, but it can take a very, very long time before you may actually find one. Certain players can probably go through the entire game without realizing these things are there. Thankfully, uh, they work the classic way. Just attack a wall to reveal if it's fake or not. Certain fake walls even contain secret bosses behind them. So just remember that there are fake walls in this game. It just might take a real long time before you actually see any, but start swinging. You're welcome. Down at number two, uh, one of the nastiest status effects in this game is death. It works a lot like Curse did in previous Dark Souls games, but here at least all it does is cause instant death and doesn't lower your max health. If you're thinking the developers at From Software have gotten soft because of that, think again, because to make up for it, they made it so death can build up crazy fast and the enemies that generate it are more aggressive than ever. Yep, the basilisks are back in this game and they're even worse than before. These guys are probably the least horrible enemies that can cause death buildup. So you're really gonna wanna get a talisman that can protect you. The Prince of Death's Pustule can be found in a deep dark crevice in Stormvale Castle in a very secret little spot. And it's one of the few ways to resist instant death in this game. To get it, get all the way to the lift side chamber checkpoint in Stormvale, then exit the room and find a corpse sitting on a ledge. Now, the fall would kill you in any other Souls-like game, but this one, you can survive it. So fall down and platform your way down to the bottom of this area. There are a few rats and one really big nasty surprise waiting for you down there, but if you manage to deal with it, then your reward is this bizarre squid man head that contains the talisman you want. Getting this thing ain't easy, but seriously, it makes certain later encounters much more manageable. Now down at number one, there's a massive and secret quest line. If there's one thing from loves, it's secrets. This game contains, and we're not exaggerating here, one of the most elaborate, complicated, and in-depth secrets we've ever seen in a game. It's really next level stuff, and it's all about uncovering the conspiracy at the heart of the game's story. Now remember where you fight that giant squid man? It's essentially here. Nearby, you can find a blood stain that shows someone that seemed to be getting killed or something, but they may look somewhat familiar. The guy in the blood stain is actually Sorcerer Roger, a, a guy you can meet in the church in Stormvale and later is found in the round table hold. You can question him about the corpse and he tells you a bit about it, but things mostly stop there unless you randomly decide to talk to the mysterious woman in the round table who will hold you for a temporary status boost. If you talk to her after talking to Roger about the corpse, uh, she'll talk to you in secret about a special knife called the Black Knife Print that was used to kill the first demigod. She gives you a map to its location, which is incredibly vague, but it's actually pointing to a spot in the northeast of Laernia, near the minor Erd tree called the Black Knife Catacombs. Inside, you need to find a fake wall leading to a bonus boss called the Black Knife Assassin. Kill them and get the Black Knife, and from there, you'll need to find Renalia in her manor, and the quest gets even more complicated at that point. But at least after that, it gets a bit more obvious about what you're supposed to do. This whole quest has you exploring the deepest and most secret parts of the game world, and it's something that is incredibly 
really easy to miss out on. And there you have it with some Elden Ring things the game doesn't tell you. A lot of these are surprises. A lot of them are really fun to figure out and stumble upon. But if you were looking for some help or maybe just some rough guidance, hopefully this stuff gives you a hand. Let us know what you think. Be sure to leave any tips for any other possible players down in the comments. But if you enjoyed this and it really helped you out, we busted our ass on this one. Clicking the like button is all you got to do. It genuinely helps us out. And if you're new, consider subscribing, maybe hitting that notification bell because we put out videos every single day. But as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.